Welcome to preeminent test prep. Today I'll be taking you through the math calculator section of SAT practice test one. I'll be showing you how to move quickly and efficiently through the math calculator section by completing this in under 30 minutes, possibly even faster. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Question one, John runs at different speeds as part of his training program. The graph shows his target heart rate at different times during his workout. On which interval is the target heart rate strictly increasing than strictly decreasing? Well, for strictly increasing then strictly decreasing, we have no plateaus, it's up and then straight down. We see we only have that here, which is between 40 and 60 minutes. So our answer there is gonna be B. Question two, if y equals k at times x, where k is a constant, and y equals 24 when x equals six, what is the value of y when x equals five? All right, well, we divide each side by six to solve for k. 24 over six is four, so we have four equals k. Now we're multiplying our x, which is five, by k, which is 4, to get y, which is going to be 20. So our answer is going to be c, because we're asked for the value of y. Question 3. In the figure below, lines L and M are parallel, and lines S and T are parallel. If the measure of angle 1 is 35, what is the measure of angle 2? Well, angle 2 here corresponds to this angle here, which corresponds to this angle here. And we see that angles 1 and 2 then add to 180, so we can do 180 minus angle 1, which is 35 degrees, to get angle 2, which then will be 145 degrees, which will be d. Question four, if 16 plus 4x is 10 more than 14, 10 more than 14 is 24, what is the value of 8x? All right, we have to solve for x first. We subtract 16 from each side. 24 minus 16 leaves us with 8. We have 8 equals 4x. Divide each side by 4, and you will get x equals 2. Now we have to multiply that 2 by 8 because it's 8x. 8 times 2 is going to give us 16. So our answer there is going to be C. Which of the following graphs best shows a strong negative association between D and T? All right, strong negative association means we're going to go down because it's negative. Also, our dots are going to be close together because it's strong, right? So we look for that. We see we have that in D. D will be our answer there. Question six. A hospital stores one type of medicine in two decagram containers based on the information given in the box above. How many one milligram doses are there in one two decagram container? All right, well, if we had two decagrams, that means we're going to have 20 grams. So we have 20 grams. Now, how many milligrams will that be? Well, one gram equals 1,000 milligrams. So for every gram we have, we have 1,000 milligrams. We're going to do 20 times our 1,000 milligrams because we have 20 grams. So we're going to get 20,000. So our answer there is going to be D. Question seven, rooftop solar panel installations in five cities. We see we have a scale of zero to nine on our y-axis. The number of rooftops with solar panel installations in five cities is shown in the graph above. If the total number of installations is 27,500, what is an appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? Well, our maximum value here is 9, and we have a total of 27,500, so we're not going to be in tens and we're not going to be in hundreds because there's no way we could get to 27,500 with only five cities and a max of 900 per city. Now we look at C, we have in thousands, right? That would work perfectly. We look at D, we have in tens of thousands. Well, we see that that cannot be our answer, right? That's not gonna be our answer. Because if it was in tens of thousands, then A is at nine, we'd have 90,000, which is already over. So our answer there is gonna be C. Eight, for what value of N is the absolute value N minus one plus one equal to zero? Well, absolute value N minus one, that's equal to zero. That's its, or its minimum value is zero because the absolute value can't be negative. Zero plus one will always give us one which means that it cannot equal zero for any value of n, so our answer there is going to be d. All right, questions 9 and 10 refer to the following information. We're just going to skip down here and move quicker. Which of the following expresses the air temperature in terms of the speed of the wave? When I see that question, all I know is I'm solving for t, right? So I go up here, I'm solving for t. I subtract 1,052 from each side. Now I'm left with 1.08t equals a minus 1,052. Now I divide each side by 1.08, right? Now I have T all alone, all right, over 1.08. So I have A minus 1,052 all over 1.08. So my answer there is gonna be A. All right, now we got question 10. At which of the following air temperatures will the speed of a sound wave be closest to 1,000 feet per second? All right, well, I know T is my temperature and I know that A is my speed of the sound wave. So we're looking at 1,000 for A. So I can go through here. I'll erase this real quick. So we have A is going to be 1,000. right? So we can go ahead and set 1,000 equals to 1,052 plus 1.08 T. Actually, you know what we can do is even quicker than that, we're just going to go ahead and plug in 1,000 for A because we already solved for what T will have to be, right? So we plug in 1,000. We have 1,000 minus 1,052 
all over 1.08. We know that that'll give us negative 52 over 1.08 will equal our temperature. We're going to plug that into our calculator, which we're going to do real quick. Sorry about that, I just bumped the mic. We got 52 over 1.08. We get 48.14. So our answer is going to be 48 because it asked us for the value closest, right? Or negative 48, right? Because it was negative. So we get B, negative 48. Now we've got question 11. Which of the following numbers is not a solution of the inequality 3x minus 5 is greater than 4x minus 3? All right, I want to get my x alone, and I want to keep it positive. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract 3x from each side, and then I'm going to add 3 to each side to get x alone. Negative 5 plus 3 will leave me with negative 2 is greater than or equal to x. So x has to be less than negative 2, right? We have b, x is less than negative 2, c, x is less than negative 2, d, x is less than negative 2. So our answer is going to be a, because a is not a solution, right? Question 12. Based on the histogram above of the following, which is closest to the average, which is just the arithmetic mean, number of seeds per apple. All right, so I'm going to do this quickly here. So I see I have 2 and I have 3 here. So I know I'm going to have a total of 6. Then I have 5 times 4, 20. 6 times 1, that's 6. 7 times 2, 14. And then I've got 9 times 3, 27. Now I'm going to add all of those and then divide by my total number of variables here, right? So I'd have two here, I have five there, or four there, I'm sorry, uh, one there, two there, all that, right? So I go ahead and add them. So I see six and 20 is going to give me 26, and then I got plus six, 32, plus 14 is going to give me 46, and then I got 46 plus 27, 46 plus 20 is going to give me 66, plus seven is going to give me 73, all divided by, I've got two here, and then I've got up here, I've got four, right here I've got one, here I've got two, and then here I've got three, right? So I just add those and that'll be my denominator. Two plus four gives me six, six plus one, seven, seven plus two, nine, nine plus three, 12. I plug that in my calculator, I've got 73 over 12, and that will give me 6.08. So my answer there is gonna be six because we're asked for the closest. Question 13, a group of 10th grade students responded to a survey that asked which math course they are currently enrolled in. The survey data were broken down as shown in the table above. Which of the following categories accounts for 19% of all survey respondents? Well, I see my total, which is my all survey respondents, is 310. I need 19% of that, and that will give me my answer as far as the number, and then I find the category for that. So I'm going to have 0.19 for 19% times 310. I plug that in my calculator. I get 58.9. So I'm looking for... A class with 59, I see I have 59 here, which is going to be males taking geometry, which is answer choice C. Question 14, lengths of fish in inches. The table above lists the lengths to nearest inch of a random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. The outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error of the mean, median, and range of values listed. Which of the following will change most if the 24-inch measurement is removed from the data? All right, right off the bat, I'm looking at range because I see it's our maximum, right? So our range is from our minimum to our maximum. We have 8 to 24. If we get rid of 24, we drop by 8 because we go to our maximum of 16. We have enough data here. The mean isn't going to change much, and the median will also not change much. So my answer there is going to be the range. All right, question 15. 15 and 16 refer to the following. Total cost of running a boat by the hour. We see y-axis there, which means we're going to have an initial cost. All right. What does the C intercept represent in the graph? Well, I just pointed that out. It's going to represent an initial cost of renting the boat, not total number of boats rented, not total number of hours, not the increase in cost for each additional hour. Go up to question 16, which of the following represents the relationship between H and C? As I just said, I'm going to have to have a Y intercept so I can get rid of A and D. And then I see I go up from 0 to 1. I go up 3, which means my slope is going to be 3, so it's going to be 3H. My answer there is going to be C. I look at 17, the complete graph of the function f is shown in the xy plane above. For what value of x is the value of f of x at its minimum? All right, I'm fine my minimum. My minimum's right there. Now I have negative 1 here. I got negative 2 there. I got negative 3 right here, right? So my answer there is going to be b. That's my value of x when I'm at my minimum. All right. Question 18. Did we just get 7? Yeah, we just got 17. Okay. Question 18. In the xy plane, if 0, 0 is a solution to the system of inequalities above, which of the following relationships between A and B must be true? 
All right, well, I can plug in 0, 0, right? So I get 0, 0. So I get A has to be positive because it has to be greater than 0. Now I plug in 0 and 0 here. I get B has to be negative because it has to be less than 0, right? If A is positive and B is negative, A has to be greater than B. Question 19, a food truck sells salads for $6.50 each and drinks for $2 each. The food truck's revenue from selling a total of 209 salads and drinks in one day was $836.50. Was How many salads were sold that day? All right, so I got to solve for salads. I know my 836.50, that's going to equal my $6.50 I get per salad. That's a salad, not a five, right? That's S. And then I have plus 2D for drinks, right? And then I also know that I sold a total of 209 between sales and drinks. So 209 will equal my S plus D. I solve for S, right? S is going to equal my 209 minus D because I subtracted D from both sides. So isolate X. Or I'm sorry, I need to solve for D there so I can plug that in, right? So D will equal 209 minus S. So now I can plug that in for D in my equation. So now I get 836.50 equals 6.5S plus 2 times 209 minus S. And I ran out of room there, but we can just quick fix that. We got 6.5 S. My 2 times my negative S will give me minus 2 S. And then I'll have plus 2 times 209, which off the top of my head will be 418. All right, so 6.5 S minus 2 S. That's just going to leave me with 4.5 S plus 418. All right, I'm just going to subtract 418 from each side and make it easier. So I get that minus 418. And that will equal my four and a half s and then i'm going to divide by four and a half all right so i'll take this sum here and then i'll divide it by four and a half so i've been or i forgot to put in that 50 cents there let me go ahead and fix that there all right and i know that's messy but i'm just trying to go quick to get you guys informed and show you how to move efficiently so i got 836.50 minus 418 and then I hit enter because we have to do that first before we divide. And then we divide by four and a half to solve for my number of sales. My number of sales is going to be 60, or I'm sorry, 93. So 93 will be our answer there. Our answer is going to be B. All right, question, do we get all those right there? Yeah, 18, 19, yep. All right, 20. Alma bought a laptop computer at a store that gave a 20% discount off its original price. The total amount she paid to the cashier was PDOCS. That's the amount she paid, not original price including an 8% sales tax on the discounted price. Which of the following represents the original price of the computer in terms of P? All right, so we're solving for the original price in terms of the paid price. Well, what we paid gets divided by all of our discounts and taxes, right? So 20% discount means that we're going to have to, pay, to take the original price, multiply it by 0 0.8 to get our discounted price, but then we have to multiply that by 1.08 because we have an 8% sales tax, right? So we're going to have the price that we paid divided by our 0 0.8 times 1.08. Another way to think about that, you can just think about it like this. If we were solving for P, right? P, the price that we paid is going to equal our original, which I'm going to write is that symbol, original price times 0 0.8 times 1.08, right? And now we divide by 0 0.8 and by 1.08 to get P. Or divide those from P to solve for our original price right there, right? So that's just another way to think about that. All right, so we got D there, 21. Dreams were called during one week. We've got data here. With this part, I'm just going to move quicker, skip down to the question, see if I can answer it without reading all that. If a person is chosen at random from those who were called at least one dream, okay, so not this, what is the probability that the person belonged to group Y? All right, of, of the people who recall at least one dream that's going to be from here to here, right? I see I had 15 and 21 there. I'll get rid of that so you can see. So of the people who had one or more dream, that's going to be 100 minus 15 for this row, 85. And then for this row, 100 minus 21, that's going to give me 79. All right, so that's going to be my total on the bottom. So I can get rid of anything less than 85 plus 79 in my denominator, right? So I can get rid of A, B, and D, actually. I can just go ahead and see it, C, right? If I want to just check that, um, yeah, I just 85 plus 79 is going to give me 164. I just put it in my calculator. So C will be our answer there. Question 22 and 23 refer to the following information. We've got a data table. I moved down, read my question because I'm trying to move fast. Which of the following best approximates the average rate of change in the annual budget for agriculture and natural sciences from 2008 to 2010? All right. 
So we've got agriculture 2008 to 2010. I see that's a difference of about 130,000. If I plug that in my calculator, it's going to be about 130,000. That took place from 2008 to 2010, two years, 130,000 over two. That's going to give me about 65 or 65 million, not thousand, but yep, $65 million per year. Yep. 23 of the following, which program's ratio of its 2007 budget to its 2010 budget is closest to the human resources program's ratio of 2007 to 2010? All right, first thing I'm doing is I'm finding human resources, 2007. We were at, I'm just going to take the first two digits, 40, and then last two of 2010, 59. So I'm looking for a similar ratio. So just looking across, I see that this is about a one and a half times increase. So I'm looking for that same thing as I look through here. I look at agriculture, I got 373 to 488. That is less than a one and a half, or I'm sorry, not a one and a half times increase, just a 50% increase, right? So 50% increase from 2007, 2010. I look at agriculture natural resources, 50% of this is gonna be at least 150,000, so that's what it would be for 300,000, so that's out. Education from 21 to 30, that's a similar ratio, so that could certainly be our answer. We look at general government, hardly an increase, that one's out. Highways and transportation, not even close to a 50% increase. Public safety was more than a 50% increase, it would look like, right? So that one will be out, our answer there will be education. Which of the following is an equation of a circle in the xy plane with center 0, 4 and a radius with the endpoint 4 thirds and 5? All right, well, my center, I see all my x's are correct. And then I look at plus y, it's got to be minus 4, so I can get rid of b and d, because our equation for a circle is going to be x minus h plus y minus k, where our center is hk, right, equals r squared. So now i got to find my radius squared. I look at my center, I have 0, 4, so from 0 to 4 thirds x, that is going to be squared because i got to use my Pythagorean theorem, right, to solve for my radius because we have two points. And then I have 4 to 5, which will be plus 1 squared, right, and that's going to equal my square root of, or that's going to equal my hypotenuse squared, which in this case will be my radius squared, right. So I go ahead and do that, and I've got 4 thirds squared, I square 4, I square 3, that's going to give me 16 over 9, and I have plus 1, I'm going to go ahead and put it in terms of 9, that's going to be 9 over 9, because I don't have to add them, 16 plus 9 over 9, that's going to give me 25 over 9, so that's going to be my end value, I already got rid of B and D, and then my answer there will be A. 25, H equals negative 4.9T squared plus 25T, I'm asked... The equation above expresses the approximate height in meters of a ball t seconds after it is launched vertically upward from the ground with an initial velocity of 25 meters per second. After approximately how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? All right. Well, when the ball hits the ground, our height's going to be zero. So I set that equal, right? And then since it's zero, I'm just going to add my 4.9 t squared to each side and then solve for t. So I'm going to have 4.9 t squared equals 25 T. I'm just going to take a quick look at my answer choice to see if I can solve that off the bat. I'm looking at my largest and my smallest. If I look at, take a look at 5, right? 5 squared, that's going to give me 25. That's about 5, so that's going to be about 125. 5 times 25 would also be 125. All right, so I know that that'd be my answer. If I really had to solve it, I would take my 4.9 T squared minus 25T. I can set it equal to 0. And I could just plug in my x instead of my t, plug in my graph and calculator, and then just see when it hits zero, right? All right, and then question 26. Katerina is a botanist studying the production of pears by two types of pear trees. She noticed that type A trees produce 20% more pears than type B trees produce, all right? So we got 1.2 times B is going to give us type A. Based on her observation, if the type A trees produced 144, how many did the type B produce? All right, so that's going to be 144 all over 1.2. We can plug that in our calculator very quickly, and we will get 120. So our answer there is going to be B. We move on, 27. A square field measures 10 meters by 10 meters. 10 students each mark off a randomly selected region of the field. Each region is a square and has side lengths of 1 meter. And no two regions overlap. The students count earthworms contained in the soil to a depth of 5 centimeters beneath the 
ground surface in each region, the results are shown in the table below. Which of the following is a reasonable approximation of the number of earthworms to a depth of 5 centimeters beneath the ground surface in the entire field? Our, our entire field is 10 meters by 10 meters, so that's 100 meters squared for our area. We know each segment is a 1 meter square, so 1 meter squared is each segment. So we have to multiply the average number of earthworms found in each region by 100 to get our approximation, right? So I'm looking at this, it's about 150, 150 times 100, that's going to give me 15,000. So my answer there is going to be C. All right, question, did we get all those? We did. Question 28. If the system of inequality is y is greater than 2x plus 1 and y is greater than 1 half x minus 1 is graphed from the xy plane above, which quadrant contains no solutions to the system? All right, well, I see I have y is greater in both cases. Um, I see I have positive slopes, right, so going up, and then I see I have y-intercept plus 1 here. Well, if my y-intercept is plus 1, I'm going up 2x, and my solution is y is greater than, I will never cross through quadrant 4. So my answer there is going to be C, quadrant 4. There will be no solutions in that system. All right, now i got question 29 below here. For a polynomial P of X, the value of P of 3 is negative 2. Which of the following must be true about P of X? All right, we get no information about what is a factor from this, right? P of 3 is 2, right? That is not telling us that negative X minus 2 is a factor, X plus 2 is a factor, or X minus 5 is a factor, right? What it is telling us, though, is that the remainder in P of X is divided by X minus 3 is negative 2, okay? Now, what we would know is that it's a factor if it equaled 0, right? That was what we would know if it's a factor, but it doesn't. It equals negative 2, so we get no information about factors from this. So just by process of elimination, we know it's not telling us anything about factors. Answer is going to be D. Question 30. We're given a graph. Which of the following is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph shown in the xy plane above, from which the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation? All right. Most important part of this, as far as I can see, coordinates of vertex A are contained as constants. My vertex here, which is at 1 and negative 16, I'm looking for those numbers to be contained. Not contained in A, not contained in B, not contained in C, they are contained in D. So my answer is going to be D. I can quick check that by plugging in my vertex and seeing if it gives me my correct answer. So Y, it's got to be negative 16. My X is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0 squared, so 0. 0 minus 16 is negative 16. It works. D is my answer. All right, now I've got our fill in the blank section. Why it can husk at least 12, dozens of, 12 dozen ears of corn per hour and at most 18 dozen ears of corn per hour? Based on this information, what is the possible amount of time and hours that it could take Wyatt to husk 72 ears of corn? Well, we can just pick a number in between here. We'll just call it 15 dozen ears of corn per hour that he does. Then we just do 72 divided by 15. And we see it's 4.8, right? So we can put in 4.8. If we want, we'll just do that, because why not? Just make it easy. All right, question 32. The posted weight limit for a covered wooden bridge is 6,000 pounds. A delivery truck that is carrying X identical boxes, each weighing 14 pounds, will pass over the bridge. The combined weight of the empty delivery truck and its driver is 4,500 pounds. What is the maximum possible value for X that will keep the combined weight of the truck driver and boxes below the bridge's posted speed limit? All right, well, once we subtract the weight of our truck and driver from our maximum amount of pounds we can have, we get 1,500. So that's the maximum amount of pounds that can come from the boxes. Each box weighs 14 pounds. So to solve for the amount of boxes we can have, we're going to do 1,500 over 14. And remember, we cannot go over. All right, so we get 107.14, but we can't go over. So we know our answer will have to be 107 because we can't go over the amount of pounds. By doing 108, our answer is going to be 107 there. Question 33, we got the graph. According to the line graph, the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? All right. Number of portable medias sold in 2008 is 100. In 2011, we had 160. So if we look at that, in 2011, we had 160, 2008, we had 100, we had 16 over 10, which can also be simplified to 8 over 5. But that is the incorrect ratio, right? That is not what fraction of the numbers sold in 2011, because that would indicate we had more in 2008, right? So we're actually, I should have put those numbers in reverse order, 
so it should have been 5 over 8. So I should have said 100 is what we had in 2008 over 160, and then gotten 10 over 16, 5 over 8. But I caught my mistake, and you should always be checking your work as you work through it so you don't make a silly mistake. One thing to know, I saw 10 over 16. I knew I had to simplify because that doesn't fit in my four boxes because it's five digits, essentially, because we have to include that dash when we fill in. So I knew it had to be simplified. So I know my answer there is five over eight. A local television sells time slots for programs in 30 minute intervals. If the station operates 24 hours per day, every day of the week, what is the total number of 30 minute time slots the station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? All right, we got 24 hours a day, 30 minute intervals. That means we can get two slots per hour. So per day, we can get 48. We know we have two days, Wednesday and Tuesday. So we multiply that by two, and now we get 96 as our answer there. Move on. We've got question 35. A dairy farmer uses a storage silo that is in the shape of a right circular cylinder above. The volume 72 pi cubic yards. What is the diameter of the base of the cylinder in yards? I want to pay attention to units just in case. All right, volume 72 pi. All right, that's going to be equal to my area on the bottom times my height. My height is given as 8. My area on the bottom is going to be pi r squared. Remember, I'm solving for diameter, not radius. So I divide each side. We'll go ahead and divide by pi, right? Get rid of that. Divide by 8 as well. So our pi is gone. And then we got 72 over 8 equals r squared. Plugging in 72 over 8 in the calculator, we're going to get 9. And we know that 9 equals r squared. We square root each side. The square root of 9 is going to be 3 equals r, but we need the diameter. So radius times 2 gives us diameter. 3 times 2 will give us 6 as our answer. All right, question 36. For what value of x is the function h above undefined? We got 1 over all this. So I know that that denominator has to equal 0 because that's where the function is undefined. So I got x minus 5 squared. So I can go ahead and do x minus 5 times x minus 5. It's going to give me x squared minus 10x plus 25, and then here, distribute that 4, I got plus 4x minus 20, and then I got plus 4, all right, that's all got to equal 0. All right, so I got x squared, I see I have negative 10x and plus 4x, which will leave me with negative 6x when I combine terms, I got plus 25 minus 20, which leaves me with plus 5, and then I have plus 4, which gives me plus 9, equals 0. I recognize, when I look at this, factors of 9 that add to negative 6 are going to be x minus 3 and x minus 3, right? I set that equal to 0. x minus 3 equal to 0. I get x equals 3. So 3 will be my answer. All right, question 27. What is the value of x in the expression? Jessica opened a bank account that earns 2% interest compounded annually. Her initial deposit was $100. She uses the expression 100x to the power of t to find the value of account after t years. The value of x is going to be 1.02 because she's earning 2% interest a year, and that's positive interest, right? She's not losing money, so we have to include that one there. So our answer is 1.02. All right, question 38. Jessica's friend, Tayshawn, found an account that earns 2.5% interest compounded annually. Tayshawn made an initial deposit of 100 into his account. At the same time, Jessica made a deposit of 100 into her account. After 10 years, how much more money will Tayshawn's initial deposit have earned than Jessica's initial deposit? Round to the nearest cent, ignore the dollar sign. Okay. So Tayshawn, he's earning 2.5%. So remember, that's 1.025 because it's 2.5%. And then we're looking at a 10-year timeline. So that's going to be raised to the power of T. And then we're going to subtract Jessica, who invested 100 at 2% interest for 10 years. And that will give us our difference, which will be our answer. I'm just going to put an equals there. Plug that in my calculator here. I got 100 times 1.025 raised to the tenth minus 100 times 1.02 raised to the tenth. And that will give me 6.109, but we're asked to round to the nearest cent, rounding to the nearest cent, that's going to give me 6.109. One one six dollars and eleven cents. So hopefully that was helpful helpful to all of you. Uh, yeah, under thirty minutes, like I said. Um, please subscribe to Preeminent Test Prep, like and share. It really helps us out. We're trying to grow. So yeah, make sure to subscribe for more great content and have a great day.